Okay, well, we're going to take a look at uh, using a computer program in order to model the gravity anomaly that we see in order to relate it back to the geology. And I'm going to use a uh, I'm going to use a model that comes from Mark Stewart's paper on the gravity over a buried valley. These are glacial valleys here, and we haven't uh, colored in the lithology and so on as yet. Uh, the program that we're going to be using is uh, a program called GMSYS. It's no longer um, uh, no longer available commercially. I believe it's embedded in the GeoSoft software, and um, but I think you you can find from Interpex Limited. You can find some excellent uh, gravity modeling surf software as well as GeoSoft and. Uh, uh, plenty of opportunities, plenty of uh, uh, algorithms, including you know may maybe developing your own to uh, uh, go through the calculations of the acceleration due to gravity over a proposed model. And of course, you know what we do what we do in in the modeling exercises we try to get the calculations to match the observations. So we have a maybe a speculative model here, and. Uh, uh, our, our aim is really to get the calculations to match these observations. And you can see at this point that the, observ the calculations for this model don't agree very well with the observations. They're a little bit low in this case, they're a little bit uh, high in this case, and, uh, and so on. Now, Stewart develops this idea. He's saying, well, you know, if the glacial valleys are quite wide compared to their thickness, um, the thickness of the uh, drift valleys are much thinner than, they, than the valleys are wide, that we can use the plate approximation in order to estimate the um, thickness of the drift. So we have our corrected um, gravity anomaly here over the glacial valleys, and uh, we could just use the plate approximation in order to estimate the, um, uh, the thickness. And this works pretty well if these... Um, uh, valleys are fairly wide. Uh, so we have a drift thickness, we have a valley with a certain uh, a valley fill with a certain density contrast. So so maybe, you know, if they're about 10 times wider than they are deep, then we get pretty close. You know, we have 5, 6 percent error maybe. <clears throat> so the assumption, uh, a formula that he comes up with is that the drift thickness then is equal to the uh, uh, gravity anomaly over the um, over the drift uh, divided by 2 pi g rho and he does this in such a way uh, that it's uh, units consistent. He's mixing units uh, to come up with uh, uh, thicknesses in feet where the anomaly is in milligal. So this 2 pi g rho gets uh, units converted, units manipulated um, uh, so that the output thicknesses are in feet. And this is basically his formula, t is equal to 130g. So this t is equal to 130g is derived from uh, the play formula again, 2 pi g r, this would be the residual anomaly, times the density, uh, density contrast actually, uh, times the thickness of the drift. Now, now we have a model down here, have a kind of a stylized uh, glacial valley. It's 5,000 feet wide in this case, so obviously not infinitely wide, and it has a depth of 0.6 uh, kilofeet here, or 600 feet. So you can see up here that the anomaly that we would see over this valley, this 600 foot deep valley, uh, is 4.25 milligals at its maximum, you know, getting away from the uh, valley walls. Now if we calculated it using this formula that Stewart develops, we would see that that anomaly should be about 4.62 milligals. So, so we're a little bit, <clears throat> we, we would be underestimating the uh, uh, <clears throat> thickness of the uh, sediments here. We would come up with this 4.25 milligal anomaly. We'd come up with a valley depth of 550 feet instead of, um, instead of 600 feet. Uh, if we narrow the valley to 1,000 feet, then we the anomaly that we would see would be only 3.12 milligals, and with a 3.12 milligal anomaly, 
that would imply that the valley is only 406 feet deep. So uh, <clears throat> this formula is pretty good if the valleys are wide. So if the valley was 6,000 feet, this error would probably drop to 5, 6 percent. Um, so, so the formula is good, but uh, for wide valleys, but then we do see edge effects. Uh, we also note that we have to kind of take our estimate of what G is at the maximum value or the minimum value uh, of the anomaly. So we have to get away from the uh, have to get away from the edges. Uh, as we mentioned before, the um, half max point or the half min point here is directly over the edge. Of the valley in both both cases, it kind of rolls off from its uh, maximum to its minimum. In this case, the density contrast is negative. <clears throat> so we have errors of 32% for the 1,000 foot wide valley and 8.3% for the 5,000 foot uh, valley. So edge effects are important. Keep that in mind when you're modeling. You're using a, 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 a simple geometrical object in order to approximate. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, anomalies that you're, to get information about the anomalies that you're looking at. So this is the computer program, and this, these are the calculations again, this solid line, this is our geological model. We have glacial till here, has a density of approximately 2 grams per cubic centimeter. We have bedrock down here, has a density of 2.6 grams per cubic centimeter. We have a density contrast then of 0.6 grams per cubic centimeter. And, and as we pointed out before, the calculations don't quite agree very well. They don't agree very well in, in, in some places. There's considerable disagreement by almost a, a milligal. So uh, the anomaly, the observations run from a little bit less than 2 to a little bit more than minus 1. So we have a span in the anomaly of about um, uh, 3 milligals from maximum to minimum. And so our task then is to get the calculations here to match the observations. So what we're going to do is we're going <clears> to <throat> take a look at this. We're going to we're going to model this. Um, uh, we're going to change the model that we have here so that the calculated gravity associated with our model agrees well with the observations. Now we could go in here point by point and you know pick up the points and and move them around and you know and improve our fit that's one way of doing it another way to do it is to um, let me bring over here this inversion setup window is to go through a um, an inversion process where we um, you know allow the program to make adjustments in the uh, in the model, in order to minimize the uh, in order to minimize the error. Now, you know, when we do this, we have to select the points that we want to allow the program to manipulate. So, bear with me here for a moment. And um, so, the idea is that the computer will take a look at all these points. And it will uh, adjust their position. Um, I've allowed it to adjust their x and y position. So we could just allow it, the points to move up and down or left and right. Um, but we're going um, <clears throat> to we're going to let it um, uh, move the points both left and right and, and up up and down. So as we've noted over here, we're, we're doing that. Uh, we're also going to let the program move the points. We're going to limit how far they move. We're going to say, well, you can move 50 feet this way, up or down, so side to side. But you can't move 100 feet. You can't move 10,000 feet. And um, that kind of keeps the program from, um, you know, getting a little wacky. So um, so we we say, okay, well, we, we're going to we're going to invert all the points. Uh, we could have done some of these by hand, but we're going to do them all. And so we go through this process, and you can see now this is where the valley valleys used to be. This is where they are now. They've they've come up. Uh, this this valley has has come up, 
and we're we're going to go on to the next step and the next step and the, and the next step and so on and um, try to get this um, um, to match and um, for some reason it got a little bit off there at the beginning but you can see um, here's where it used to be this is where it is now we have pretty agreement between pretty good agreement between the um, um, calculations the solid line and the observations the uh, the data points here maybe with this exception here you can see we could probably go a little bit further uh, and um, uh, you know work on this a little bit more we could uh, come in here perhaps and just you know maybe move that up by hand and so on so we we can see that we end up with a different uh, model of the glacial drift than we did to begin with and um, we've minimized uh, the error between the calculations and the observations. Now, if you thought, well, you know, I really don't believe some of these jagged features in here, you might come in and decide to, you know, to make some adjustments and, uh, um, you know, make it make it look a little bit smoother and so on. So that that's something that the geologist uh, and the geophysicist can do uh, together. I mean, it has to be geologically reasonable. So. So these are buried glacial valleys. You'd expect them to be a little bit smoother, perhaps, in uh, in their profile. But that's that's um, that's the basic uh, process that one goes through when one does a um, when one goes through the the um, uh, the inversion inversion process. So we we uh, started off we went through the inversion process. We try to minimize the difference between the calculations and the observations. And we do this in an iterative fashion, so we go as many steps as we think that we need to. Uh, you know, we aren't quite there yet. This is where the original calculations were. After one iteration, we've gotten a little bit closer, and we um, keep, um, keep going, and uh, so we've moved these calculations significantly closer, but they still aren't a perfect match. Now we have a, a much better match. You can see where the uh, glacial valley used to be. It used to be deeper. We had to move it up in order to bring uh, what was kind of an undershoot in terms of the anomaly that was produced by this uh, valley that was originally in the cross section uh, so that the calculations over this value valley would... Uh, agree with the uh, observations. Over here we can't see it, uh, it's kind of covered up, but we had to make this valley deeper uh, because the original um, uh, the original calculations over the model were too high. Uh, they were sitting above the observations. So that's the um, that's a, a brief um, explanation of the modeling process. You know we we knew that we would, you know, just manually adjusting the data points that we had to increase the uh, or decrease the depth of bedrock over here in order to to get the calculations to come up. And, and the computer program has done that for all the data points. Over here, we had to increase the depth to bedrock in order to bring the calculations down. So, so this is, um, uh, you know, a useful. Um, time-saving uh, exercise in, in days gone by, one pretty much had to go in uh, iteratively by hand and, and just make these adjustments. And uh, So uh, the next time we're going to talk about, now we've made an assumption here that these valleys are infinitely long and go in and out of the section to plus and minus infinity or at least significant distances in and out of the section. Now this is a plan view, this is kilometers, this is 0, 5, 10, 0, 5, 10 kilometers uh, in and out of the cross-section that we're looking at below. Now realistically we know that those valleys don't extend to plus and minus infinity. So in the next um, uh, video we'll take a look at how we can kind of manage this process here 
and see what the edge effects are as we kind of bring those valley edges in closer and closer. What happens to this anomaly? Uh, and then what kind of an inversion process do we have to go through in order to bring the calculations back into agreement with the observations? So thanks for joining us. See you next time.